All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamar Garcia. I'm the vice president of your alumni chapter. Uh, today is uh, our March Lunch and Learn topic, eight common characteristics of people who are successful at entrepreneurship in life. Today, our speaker is Jeff Greenberg, the managing director of Tech Coast Works. Uh, Jeff has been fortunate enough to have experienced success in three phases of his career, initially as a corporate executive, then as an entrepreneur, and currently as a consultant and professor of innovation and entrepreneurship. Jeff is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the history of UCI, having paid royalties of about $1 million from companies he has founded based on UCI licensed technologies. Um, as a consultant, he helps tech entrepreneurs around, from around the world navigate the path from invention to commercial success. He currently teaches on various innovation and entrepreneurship topics at UCI, Cal State Fullerton, and Irvine Valley College. Jeff holds a BS in computer science from Rutgers, a master's in computer science from UC Irvine, and an MBA from Pepperdine. Um, in speaking with uh, Jeff, uh, we thought this would be a great topic um, so this is, uh, so Jeff, this is currently a, um, a class that you teach, uh, this, uh, the, the eight common characteristics, um, and it's a, it's a book, it's based on a, it's based on a book, correct? That is correct, yes. So I actually, I, I went and I, I did buy the book after you, after you, we talked and I didn't have a chance to read it. So I'm actually, this will be kind of the first, I, I did browse through it. So um, I'm just at least to prepare myself, but at least um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hear, uh, hear your presentation. We, we also, this is meant to be very interactive. So we wanted to do like sort of a, you know, Jeff would do the, the, the book report, basically walk through the content. Um, and, and present, but also this is really meant to be interactive. So please feel free, take yourself off mute um, and um, um, be part of the discussion. Um, Jeff, I'm gonna stop sharing. I will just hand it right off to you. Okay. So uh, my share button got hidden now. Let's see, there we go. All right. Okay, so we still have a few people wandering in, um, but uh, about three years ago, um, I was asked by Irvine Valley College to start teaching a sequence of courses, which is essentially an introduction to entrepreneurship. And it consists of three classes. The first class is a one credit class that they call Pathways to Success, but it's really based on the book we're gonna be discussing today. And that's followed by a one credit class on how to do market validation. For many entrepreneurs, they get an idea and they go to market with it without ever checking to see if their idea is consistent with the needs of the market. So do a little bit of, of uh, instruction on how to verify people actually want the thing you're gonna build and are willing to pay for it and, and who those people are so you can do your targeted marketing. And then the third class is how to build a business model canvas. I'm not gonna go into those two topics, but I just, the, the whole point of it is to earn actually a certificate from Irvine Valley College on entrepreneurship. So the beginning of it is based on this book though. Um, come on, there we go. Called Who Owns the Ice House? Uh, I have a copy of it right there. Um, fairly easy read. Uh, you could easily do it in, a, in an afternoon if you want. Um, I put all the information here. The book is written by Clifton Talbert, as it says there, um, who uh, was an African-American growing up in the Mississippi Delta in the 1940s during the Jim Crow era. And it tells the story of his uncle, who sort of accidentally became a successful entrepreneur selling ice because back then people didn't have electric refrigerators and they didn't want their food to spoil. They would have these things that were called ice boxes with just an insulated box. And every few days, the ice man would come and put a giant cube of ice into a, a cavity and 
it would keep things cold until you got the next block of ice. And, and Uncle Cleve, as we, we, we get to know him, became very successful just delivering ice to this area of the Mississippi Delta. And in review, Clifton went on to become a very successful entrepreneur himself based on the principles he learned observing his Uncle Cleve and eventually wrote this book that describes these eight characteristics. And when I first started teaching this class, I thought it was a little hokey. But as I got into it more, I realized these really are eight characteristics, not just for being successful in entrepreneurship, but also being successful in business and even successful in life. And, and I now weave um, parts of this book into almost every other class I teach and into many of the consulting engagements I have with entrepreneurs around the country. So as I said, it's based on eight chapters um, and the first chapter is called choice and, and each of the chapters has a one word title. And the paragraph here is from the publishers, how they describe, summarize the chapter on choice um, in just a few words. Um, and it's, it's about explicitly making choices. What I have learned though, and, and what I'm gonna talk about, and again, as, as Jamar said, let's make this interactive. Let's talk about examples of, of when we had the opportunity to make choices. And I actually believe the biggest challenge for most of us to making choices is not always realizing there is a choice. Because the bottom line is almost everything you do is a choice. Coming to this session is a choice. Um, even for my students, I tell them coming to this session of the class is a choice. You can show up, you cannot show up. There are consequences either way. Be aware of those consequences, but be aware that it is your choice. And, and I believe the hardest part about making choices is realizing there are so many opportunities to make choice. So uh, we often talk about this as getting out of the box. Well, the most important part to out of the box thinking is realizing you are in a box as demonstrated here. Um, I, I put lots of time into the artistry of this uh, slide. So, and, and I'm gonna give an example from my life. <clears throat> All three of my daughters uh, were spent four years in the marching band at Woodbridge High School, which has a phenomenal program. They actually won a Grammy a few years ago. When my oldest daughter was in her freshman year, the band was invited to participate in the first national high school marching band competition at the White House. And I was asked to be a chaperone. At the time, my company, Hyperwall, the company that makes the big video wall over at the, the Cove, um, was very young. And I said to myself, I'm too busy to make the trip. So I didn't go. And I missed my daughter's first trip to Washington, DC, a little disappointing. I missed seeing my daughter perform at the White House. Pretty big disappointing. But here's the real kicker. They won, and I missed seeing my daughter and the rest of the band earn the title national champion. And I'm never going to forgive myself for that because I didn't realize I had a choice. I could have gone and I could have figured out how to handle my business remotely. In fact, a couple of years later, she had graduated. My other two daughters were in the band, was invited to go to perform at Disney World. And I didn't even think about how I was gonna make it happen. I just said, yes, I'm going. Um, and then I figured out how am I gonna run my business remotely from Orlando? And uh, I set up my phone as a hotspot. This was in the early days of hotspot. I actually closed a $15,000 deal on the shuttle bus from Orlando airport to our hotel because I realized I do have a choice and my choice is go. The bottom line is anytime in your head you say something like, I have to do this, or I need to do this, or I must do that, reword it. 
and say to yourself, I choose to do this and I choose to do that. And then if you say, no, that's not actually what I would choose, then make the other choice and figure out how to work, make it work. That is one of the keys to, to being more successful, realizing you have lots of choices. Another example from, from my life, um, I had two degrees in computer science, started getting moved into a marketing role, and one day realized I didn't know anything about marketing or business. I needed an MBA. And I did some research. Sorry, this is not disloyalty. I decided at the time, Pepperdine had the best MBA, executive MBA program. I applied for it and was rejected. And at that point, you've got to go to your second choice, except I didn't. I decided to reject their rejection, not the option most people would think of. And I just stayed on them and I pursued them relentlessly until they finally relented and admitted me into the program. And I ended up with what I thought was an awesome education, exactly what I needed, because I saw a choice to reject their rejection and acted on it. And when you, when you start seeing there is a box, you can get out of it and make the choice that's actually best for you. So Jeff, so, are we are we okay with uh, interrupting you in the middle? Yes, I was going to say in the okay. interest of making this interact active, anybody else have a similar story? No, that's great, and uh, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that, and and you know, so just hearing that, I mean, it hits home for me just because you know, like I uh, split a lot of time, or at least I, I um, like to be involved with. Um, my kids activities as well. And so my, my, my daughters are dancers. And so, you know, going to like competitions and taking, you know, taking time away from work to, you know, take them to take them to class and just trying to be involved. I, I find myself torn, right? So it's like, while, you know, taking time away from the, you know, from, from work and from my business, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be an active dad. And, and even, even recently was like, man, I need to do an audit of my time and figure out, well, you know, like what, what's, what are my priorities? And, you know, I think this is huge, you know, being able to, um, you know, have, have that and really think about what's like, what are my personal priorities and what, you know, how do I fit things around, you know, my, um, uh, my priorities of being a dad, but also, you know, work and business. So, so I would make one minor uh, correction. You don't need to do an audit to know your priorities. You know what they should be. Mm. You just need to figure out how to follow through on those. And that's where choice comes in. Uh, when I was running Hyperwall and interviewing candidates, they would ask me something like, you know, is it okay if I take a day off when my kid has a, a school play? And I would say, it's not okay. It's mandatory. If I find you're showing up to work on a day when your kid's performing, I'm going to throw you out of the office. You've got to get your priorities right. So, so yes, we all need to be better at doing that. I love your story though about how you rejected the rejection. I think there's a big lesson there, you know, because I think especially just like for, you know, uh, on 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 the topic of like negotiating. I mean, my my old boss used to tell me like rule number one of negotiations is that nothing is negotiable. Rule number two is that everything is negotiable. Right. And so I think that's sort of, you know, you got to look at things from all sides and say, you know, um, kind of go after what you want. Yep. Um, great. Okay. So that's the first chapter of the book, choice. Chapter two, opportunity. What is an opportunity? Um, and, and again, here's the text that they wrote in a brochure that describes that. To me, the general rule of thumb is anytime you or somebody you know has a problem and does not have a satisfactory solution or an optimal solution, that is a potential opportunity. What I like to say though is once there's an identified problem, let's look for a sweet spot. The sweet spot being at the intersection of these three items in the Venn diagram. We're all computer scientists, so we can talk about Venn diagrams. We should all know that. Um, 
And, and this Venn diagram says, number one, there has to be a market requirement. It can't just be something you dreamed up in your head for your own use, because if you're the only one who's going to ever buy it, you're not going to make much of a business out of it. But look at three things. Is there a substantial enough market for this? Is it possible to do? I mean, sure, we'd all love a little badge. We can tap on our chest and say, uh, beam me to New York, beam me to Tokyo, right? And then Scotty just gets us there. But the technology doesn't exist. And then the third thing is to make sure you have some kind of sustainable competitive advantage or at least can establish one. And if, if you find, it, find a problem that satisfies these three requirements, fits into this little bullseye area, that is a real opportunity. And just like Uncle Cleve started a business delivering ice in the hot, um, steamy Mississippi Delta, um, you may have found an opportunity that can actually be the basis of a, uh, uh, of a successful business. So it starts though by recognizing a pain point that is not in the eye of the person being pained adequately solved. Boy, I didn't really structure that sentence very well, but hopefully you all got what I mean. Hey, as computer scientists, you should know how to parse things too, right? So build a compiler to, to uh, parse that statement, but, but hopefully you get it, right? Find something at that intersection and that becomes a business opportunity. Has anybody ever done that? F found a pain point? and um, figured out how to solve it, made a business out of it? No? Go. All right, Jamar, you're up. It's just going to be the Jamar and Jeff. <laughs> um, no, yeah, and, and, uh, for everyone else, yeah, feel free. I mean, we're, yeah, we won't bite. So feel, feel free to take yourself <laughs> off mute. So if you have yeah, anything to jump in there, uh, jump in with any comments. But um, yeah, I think that. Um, uh, so yeah, I've I, I, I've built a couple uh, products and whatnot that that have kind of been built around um, pain points, and it's interesting because I find that while there's almost like two ways, like one one where we find something that's cool to build, and then you know you kind of try to find a problem to to is it was it a technology to find a problem um, to you know. Uh, I guess to to fix for mm -hmm. those for those sorts of I guess like ideas, and I'm sure you've run into this with with your you know people that you work with. Are those ever successful, or are those like if you ever see like a technology trying to look for a problem, that's sort of like you just got to scrap that idea. Well, sometimes the technology there is a market for it, but your chances of success go way up if you actually know the problem and tailor your product to solve that specific problem. But I'll be honest, Hyperwall didn't start that way. Hyperwall started as an academic research project. Hmm. Um, uh, I was given the opportunity to license it from the university, I did. And we just started throwing it at various markets. And one market, we started having success, and that was doing command and control centers. And so once I recognized that pattern, we focused the product features on command and control. We, we developed distribution strategies that got there. And uh, with an initial capital investment of 150 bucks, in fact, total capital investment, to this day, it's a 12-year-old company. There's been 150 bucks invested in it. And it's a global multi-million dollar business with customers in about 60 countries. Um, pretty good, pretty so, good return. No, not, not we too bad. did not start with a problem. We started mm. with the technology. So we did it backwards. But had we started with the problem, we could have optimized for it and gotten to the inflection point of success. We could have gotten there faster. Gotcha. Gotcha. All we right. Moving on to chapter three action. So one of the key, key attributes of an entrepreneur is to actually do stuff. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who call themselves entrepreneurs, and they sit around talking about ideas and daydreaming about it. 
But that's not an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur has to actually do stuff. Now, this concept is actually a little bit in contradiction with one of the other co concepts or characteristics I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But but key to to success in entrepreneurship, and again, to success in life in general, is a pro uh, a prolection towards taking action, not just sitting there and thinking about it, um, not just analyzing the heck out of it. Anybody who's worked in the corporate world has probably heard the phrase um, analysis paralysis. We're so busy figuring out what we're going to do, we never actually do anything. Um, a, a successful entrepreneur and most successful people need to have a good balance of analyzing but also not waiting forever. Get to market, try it. Last few years, um, uh, there's been numerous books that talk about the value of experimentation for small businesses. Don't try and get it right. Get something out there. This is the principle of the book, The Lean Startup. Get it out there. Recognize you might make mistakes. Get some feedback. Adjust and try again. Now, that always has to be tempered by the cost of the mistake. When you're a small business, if you don't have a, a missing a key feature or your positioning is a little off, the cost to correct that is minimal. On the other hand, if you're a company like Boeing, that's going to invest uh, billions of dollars in developing the next generation jetliner, the cost of a mistake, um, as we witnessed a couple of years ago, can be millions or billions of dollars in losses and death, as in the case of the, the 757 MAX, right? Is that, is that, I think that was the name of it. The, the plane that had a couple of crashes killing people. So uh, look at the cost of a failure. And if it's not that high, try something, treat it as an experiment, look at the feedback, make adjustments and move on. And again, that's covered very nicely in the book, The Lean Startup. Okay, we're at four, oh, pretty good pace. Okay, knowledge. So this is the one that's a little bit in contradiction with action. In order to do a smart business, be smart about it, you have to accumulate lots of knowledge about the business, about the competitors, about the marketplace, about the technology about the supply chain, about the distribution chain. There's lots and lots of things to do. And in the old days, you would write a business plan that was 70 or 80 pages long or 150 pages long. In fact, my MBA thesis was a strategic plan for my employer at the time, which was the laptop division of Toshiba. And it was an 80 page um, business plan. But like most documents that long, by the time it was finished, it was obsolete. And, and so again, this is part of the lean startup concept is don't try and plan everything advanced, just get some general concepts. So instead of having 360 degrees of possibilities to go, try to narrow it down to maybe 45 degrees. And then as you're on in that direction, you can narrow it down more and more, maybe make minor course adjustments, but start moving. And, and one of the tools that's used now to identify the knowledge you're going to need and a way to collect it is the business model canvas, which is a, a, a one page document um, with nine boxes on it. And if you fill in each of these nine boxes, it will give you a good understanding of what your business might be. And you can then perform mental experiments. Well, what if I change the customer segment from this customer to that customer? Well, that might require a, a distribution channel change, which might require a pricing change, and it might also um, require a change in value proposition. So when you make a change to one of these boxes, it may cascade changes through all the others. And when you come up with a set of values in each of these boxes that are consistent, then you know, at least at a high level, you've thought through all the key aspects of planning your business and you can start executing and start putting a little bit more details into each of these nine key areas. 
Are these nine key areas the key areas for every business that's being launched? No, but in general, they're pretty accurate and, and it works. And I've actually used this um, not just with my teaching, but also uh, with some of my consulting work. And, and I've had clients use this. Just curious, has anybody used business model canvases in their business planning? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So actually, just you and me I, and I just put I just put the book. I think uh, so. Business model generation. I think I don't know if that's so. This book, the strategizer book. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. I, it's it's this this is the Bible <laughs> for for creating these things. Yeah. No, it's great, and that book is pretty awesome. It it goes okay. into it it breaks down different businesses that we all know and love and kind of creates patterns around that for the pattern, you know, pattern geeks that like to see, you know, um, yes. like the, like um, it has like Google up, you know, Google there. Um, uh, I think might even have like, you know, Facebook, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great because I like how it you know, breaks down those different pieces uh, of, of the business model. And when you really think about what your business is, like it is basically a combination of all these different pieces. Right. Um, one question and, and re relative to this as well, and it kind of goes back to the experiments that, you know, um, as far as like running experiments on, on your business, are there like, is there like a priority order that's like, okay, first we should probably, you know, first we should test, I don't know, like test the market or test the hypotheses of, around how we understand the market. Are there, are there things that you would want to, or you would advise entrepreneurs test first? Um, around their business? So uh, there's no blanket uh, response to that because the highest priority is, is generally where you have the highest degree of unknowns, right? Mm. This, this chapter of the book is about knowledge. You need to develop knowledge. By the way, I, I, I become, as, as I get older and older, a stronger um, believer in always learning more, right? Continuous learning, continuous improvement, not of a process, but continuous improvement of yourself. And one of the characteristics of, a, of an entrepreneur is they acquire knowledge, but they also have to decide when is the, I have enough knowledge to be confident I can be successful, um, not to wait. So entrepreneurs are very good at being able to make decisions on incomplete knowledge. They have mm. to be. And the priority should be, as you start operating, where is your greatest degree of vulnerability, your greatest degree of uncertainty? That's what I would go into trying to refine or, or perhaps where are you getting the greatest amount of pushback and, and prioritize refinement based on that. Gotcha, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and everybody else is just going to stay stay quiet. How about somebody else just turning on their camera and microphone and just saying hi? Let's just see if that, if anybody's audio is actually working. Hi. Oh, Gorin. Okay, Gorin's works. Yay. <laughs> hi, Jim. Right. Hi, Great insights. I'm just listening in. So. Okay. Cool. Um, hundred and fifty percent. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Can I, can I say something to back up what you're saying? Sure. Um, one thing that I like to uh, tell folks is you're going to find out what your customers like and want. You're going to find out. Yeah. It's just better to do it sooner. And uh, if you launch a product, you can totally launch it. And then you'll find out what they like about it, what they don't like. But <clears throat> you should do more tests earlier. <laughs> you should do your homework because it's cheaper, cheaper, uh, the earlier you find out more things. So it's just one good way to look at it. Absolutely. But the, the, the sooner you know what they want, the sooner you can give it to them, and the sooner your business really takes off. I, I love the story. I believe it's of Zappos, how they, the, the first hypothesis they wanted to test was, will people buy shoes online, right? And it wasn't that... so. They didn't um, go off and build, you know, the whole, the whole business. They, you know, set up a website and then bought 
bought shoes, you know, bought shoes from a retailer and then just resold them. Right. So they didn't have all the deals. They didn't have like all, you know, the, the other parts of the business model. They just wanted to test, are people going to buy shoes online? And so getting to answer, getting to the answer um, in, in the cheapest, quickest way possible. I think that's, that's definitely the key. Yeah, there was, there was a, a guy who was one of the um, startups at the Cove. Uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, he was faced with having to spend tens of thousands of dollars to automate a, a website to process customer requests. And I said to him, you know what? Don't automate it. Build a front end that collects the data and then do manual processing behind the scenes until we figure out the details of it. And he hadn't thought about that. He did that. Instead of tens of thousands of dollars, I think he spent 1500 bucks. He got a website up that collected information. He manually processed it. And last I heard, he was actually starting to close some really big deals with it. So yes, learn as you go. Uh, uh, this, this concept, by the way, there's now a name for it. It's called the Wizard of Oz, right? Do a Wizard of Oz website where there, there's nothing, but, you know, it's just a guy behind the curtain pulling strings. To the customer, it looks real, but don't waste time and money implementing all the details until you're sure you've got the details right. Then automate them. But there's nothing wrong with doing a little bit of manual processing in the beginning while you're still on the learning curve. What if the hi? This is Melissa. Uh, what if the what if the concept is something with a high barrier to entry? So you're Boeing and uh, your device is an airplane, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, as we mentioned earlier, um, the the cost of a mistake is much higher there. So so you do have to do more, um, but also. Boeing has existing relationships with every airline in the world, just about, and it's not hard for them to set up those meetings to ask them, what do you want in the next jetliner? Greater efficiency, greater capacity, greater comfort. Ask them and, um, and ask the travelers. Many years ago, I was actually asked to be part of a focus group um, this is when I was traveling to Japan frequently, actually when I was working for Toshiba. And I was asked to go into a focus group to see if, if how much more I would spend to ride on a supersonic jetliner that could reduce the flight time from LA to, to Tokyo by 50%. <clears throat> so somebody, I don't know if it's an airline or an, air, uh, uh, or an airplane manufacturer, was seriously considering it and doing the market research. And they ended up not doing it. And I assume it's because they, <clears throat> the technology didn't exist to solve the problem in a way that was compelling. My biggest concern was they said they were going to do flight time from, six hour, from 12 hours to six hours, cutting it off by 50%. I pointed out that it's not a 12-hour flight. It's an 18-hour journey from the time I leave my house to fighting the freeways to get to LAX, going through all the security checks, then flying, then landing at um, Narita, going through all the security checks there, then waiting for a shuttle bus to take me downtown. They haven't cut that 18 hour journey by 50%. They've only cut it by a third. And to me, it was questionable if that was worth paying three to four times the airfare, which is what they were asking. So yes, do the research, even for big ticket items. And yes, the research should cost more and take longer because the cost of a mistake is bigger. It was actually really fun being in the focus group, by the way. Okay, so another part of, of knowledge is is knowing how much. And, and so I present the serenity prayer, which we've all heard, but I think it really matters for entrepreneurs because 
one of the things I see entrepreneurs doing incorrectly, not just entrepreneurs, but everybody is <clears throat> trying to do too much. I think you're always most effective when you pick the two or three most important things, you get them done, then you move on to the next one and the next one. And so the serenity prayer reminds me to think about what can I actually do, focus my energies there, and don't waste time, don't stress out on the things I cannot change. So just an additional thought. All right, chapter five, wealth. And in the original book, Uncle Cleve, the purveyor of ice in the Mississippi Delta, was not a millionaire. I don't even know if he was a hundred thousand there. Of course, this was in the 1940s and 50s when when money uh, was a lot more valuable than it is today um, before all the inflation. But wealth shouldn't be measured necessarily in money. It should be measured, I believe, and the book believes in in how content you are, how satisfied you are. Um, do you just want to be able to relax at the side of the pool with an exotic drink with an umbrella in it? And to me, that's is sort of uh, a symbol of success is that I can afford to spend time by a body of water, whether it's a pool or a lake or a river or an ocean. But if you're a true entrepreneur, you'll only stay there for, for a small amount of time. Then you're going to get bored and you're going to jump back in either with the same company or another company. But measure wealth, measure success, if you will, in how content are you? How happy are you? Are you able to live the life you want? Don't get trapped in the constant pursuit of more. I want more money. I want more control. I want more power. Instead, learn when to be content and live a happy, contented life. And so according to the book, that's the way to measure wealth. Do you have enough money to get the things you need to be happy? Okay. One, one, one comment there, Jeff, um, on, on wealth. I, um, I read somewhere, and I really like this definition of wealth, wealth being discretionary time. Why, why just discretionary? Why not work, right? If you love what you'll do, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. So I would apply it to all 24 hours, not just the four hours you're awake and not working. Well, I mean that the more discretionary time you have, the, okay. the wealthier, the wealthier you are. Right. So if you have a choice and you if you can gather enough, you know, let's say financial resources to be able to do what you want with your time. Right. And and have more discretionary time then that is a. It, as a it way to, might to... be, although I, I'm going to be honest, right now, I am overcommitted. I'm teaching mm. two classes. Uh, I, I've got a handful of clients around the world. Um, and I'm also dealing with some health issues for my parents. And I do not have enough time to do it all. I don't have discretionary time, but I love all the stuff I'm doing, except the dealing with my parents' health issues. And but that's, that's got to be the top priority. I mean, it, mm. it, it, it trumps everything else. And after that, I love the teaching. I love the consulting. I love doing this kind of stuff. So I don't have discretionary time. But to me, this is all the stuff I want to do anyway. So it, it, it depends on how each of us, um, according to Maslow's hierarchy, how each of us achieve self-actualization. Mm. And, and I achieve self-actualization by helping others be more successful in what, what they're trying to pursue. And I would do more of it if I had more time. But by the way, that's a common pain point. If one of you can solve the 24 hour limit to the day, I think that would be awesome. My, my, if I had one, one uh, superpower, it'd be, I forget the, what's the show called, Out of This World when back, back in like the, uh, 90s where you could like freeze time like this oh. that, <laughs> that that would be my superpower i wish i could do that because yeah just freeze time so i could take a nap <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so chapter six of the book is brand and brand is really 
who you are and who you want people to think you are, it's, it really is your reputation, right? Um, it doesn't matter how smart you are. Uh, it doesn't matter how rich you are. If you've got a strong brand, people are going to want to work with you. And if you don't, they're not. I think the greatest example of this is Steve Jobs, who, when he founded Apple, had a horrible reputation because he treated people horribly. And eventually, the board fired him, um, partly for that. He went off and sort of rediscovered himself. And when, he, when they brought him back, because nobody else could run Apple as well as him, he came back a much more mellow, much more uh, empathy practicing person. And um, he's been quoted many times as saying, and this is, this is on his second tour of duty at Apple, um, we don't hire smart people so we can tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do, right? And that's recognition of the fact that he wasn't always the smartest person in the room. And his brand changed substantially between his first time running Apple and his second time running Apple. And the, the Steve Jobs 2.0, if you will, was a much easier person to work for. I know multiple people who worked for Steve Jobs 1.0 and left because they just couldn't handle it. Now, he did build a successful company, but does that mean he was successful, right? And if we go back to the definition of wealth, we just looked at maybe he wasn't because he was never content. He was always driven for more and never satisfied with what he had. Not to say he wasn't a brilliant visionary. I don't want anybody to think I don't, I don't, I don't get that. He certainly was. I mean, he really did change multiple industries, right? The phone industry, the music industry, <coughs> the computer industry. Uh, uh, pretty remarkable. But the way you treat people, the way you treat customers, the way you interact, establishes your brand, your reputation, and it takes a huge amount of time to develop a strong brand and almost no time to destroy it. So you've got to be ever vigilant in ensuring that no matter how bad things are going internally, you always present a positive um, perspective to the world. In this book, by the way, um, Uncle Cleve's brand was absolute reliability. If he said your ice was gonna be there by 6 p.m. on Tuesday, it was there. And it was delivered with a smile, no matter how hot it was, no matter what the weather was, he got there um, and he delivered what he was supposed to do and he did it pleasantly and polite. Um, even though, by the way, in the beginning, his clients were all black, but eventually um, he expanded into the white community and they weren't always respectful of him but he never, he never disrespected them back. And eventually even they grew to appreciate him. So, so he, while he wasn't necessarily thinking of the word brand, he actually did all the right things to build that brand, which allowed him to have a great reputation and expand his business. Hey, we're right on time. Okay. Chapter seven is about community, right? We all know it takes a village to raise a baby. Well, it also takes a village to raise a startup. In fact, my company that I do my consulting under is called Tech Ghost Works. And you see my logo down here? That's actually was designed from the beginning to represent the startup in the middle and the community surrounding it. The investors, the mentors, the coaches, the consultants, the employees, the, 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 the partners, those are the outer circles. And by the way, this is actually in UCI official colors. So uh, I, I, I maintain my loyalty to the university um, in doing that. So, so building a community because none of us is smart enough or powerful enough or, or um, penetrating enough to do everything on our own. So you've got to build a network. When I was running Hyperwall for existence, for example, we decided we had to go into the command and control center 
And one of the things we knew is that our software required lots of displays to make effective video walls. So who was one of the beneficiaries of it? Display companies. So I contacted the world's largest display company. Who can, who can guess who that is? Come on, somebody. Nobody? Samsung. Samsung is the world's largest. I was largest just going to say company. Samsung. You, but you didn't, so forget <laughs> it. <laughs> you could have said that to whatever company I said. All right. It was Samsung. So I cold called Samsung and said, we've got some software that will help you sell more displays. They realized it. Um, we signed a, a, a global temporarily exclusive distribution license with them. And now all of a sudden Hyperwall, which at the time was uh, three part-time employees with some university developed technology, was actually selling software all over the world courtesy of Samsung's global sales force. And we didn't know who the customers were. We would just get royalty reports every month from Samsung. Hey, we sold 50 in this country. We sold 20 in that country. And then eventually some of those customers would start contacting us to talk about product enhancements and things like this. But we networked through Samsung and through them and then eventually through NEC, we built a global network of dealers that could reach markets we could never get to. And in fact, markets that to this day, no member of the Hyperwall team has ever been to, but we built a network with global reach. So, so this network can get you places you can't go on your own. It can give you intelligence. It can give you connections. It can give you resources that you may not have. So this, and this all is dependent on brand. If you build the right brand, it's easy to expand your network. <coughs> and if you do that, you have more resources at your command that you can use to overcome whatever obstacles you're facing. Yeah, I feel like for, especially for tech focused um, founders, you know, so let's say folks that are ICS folks that are looking to start their own business. I almost feel like this is like put an asterisk around this topic, right? Because really like the success in your business is gonna be around, like your biggest challenge is gonna be around distribution, right? At least to start, like if you, you're gonna to need to sell something, right? And so if you are starting from zero, then really looking at your network that's got distribution, if you can create a product that can help them make money, mm -hmm that's gonna be a good way for you to, to get started. Hold that thought for two more slides. Okay, chapter eight, persistence, right? Entrepreneurs and anybody who's successful in business don't give up easy, but there's an old saying, don't work harder, work smarter. And, and I think a quote, um, often attributed to Albert Einstein says it best, right? Don't do the same thing over and over again. I, it was about two weeks ago. No, maybe it's a little more than that. I was on the phone with a consult with a client, and there's an area they've been failing in over and over again. And I said, "What are you going to do about it?" And they said, "We're going to try harder." And I said, "No." Trying harder is not going to solve the problem. You got to try something different. Albert Einstein knew it. Why don't you? Um, so it's about, about getting out of the box, right? Doing something different than what you've been doing. Recognize you're constrained. You've accepted the fact that you're in a box without fighting it. Recognize you're in a box which is constraining you. Figure out how to overcome those constraints and do things differently to get different results. So, so um, don't give up, but don't just keep banging your head against the wall. Go try a different wall, go open the door, go open the window, whatever, but do something different. Don't just give up, but, but do something different. So, 
So back to what Jamar would, had, had said, here are the eight key characteristics. And actually what I wanted to close with is a discussion based on what we've just gone over, which of these are most important? Where's the greatest lesson from, from this hour? What do you remember the most about what we've talked about? Action. Action, okay. I'm not gonna record the votes, but there's one vote for action. Uh, I would say action as well. Okay. And everybody else can come off mute and say something. Or you can just be lurkers in the background. Boy, this, this crowd's tough. <laughs> I would say some combination of all of them. Call it a new <laughs> category. Call it a oh. new category. Blended, blended, blended heuristic which combines 0.2% of choice, 0.1% of opportunity, 6% of action, 3% of brand. <laughs> so look, you're look, looks like we're lacking in choice. <laughs> you're the politician in the group then, huh? <laughs> so there's, the, the bottom line is there's no one answer. You well, need all, and, you need and, all and, of them in some some you know mutated combination to make it work. There's no, there's no one. Thing I, I agree. Like most difficult decisions, the truth is usually somewhere in the middle, right? right. right. Um, but assuming this discussion had an impact on you, and you're going to go talk about it to somebody later, which of these things are you going to talk about first? So I mean, it again depends on on the on the life stage of an entrepreneur, right? So for yep, someone yep. who has all for someone who's already done action before, that's of less interest. But maybe the opportunity precedes that, right? For someone who already has a brand, he's looking for an opportunity because he already has a brand, sure. right? So but I would no, also yeah. encourage you not to think about this as lessons for entrepreneurship. Think about it as lessons for life, because. While I presented it about business, it really can help you live a better life, not just about your job or your business, but about everything you do. That's correct. Anybody else? Dan, my old friend who's been sitting in the background quietly. I've known <laughs> Dan longer than anybody else on this call. Are you going to pop up and say hi? There he is. Oh, you're not Dan. Wait, oh, there he is. Hello. Dan and I played volleyball together at the UCI Volleyball Club, which we co-founded. Do you remember that? Yeah, we did co-found it, and we met at Rutgers University, and then we moved back to Irvine, right. to UC Irvine. Uh, so first of all, uh, great to see you. Um, this is fascinating for me here. It's also fascinating for me to hear how you evolved from being uh, being a, a, a graduate student uh, at ICS at Irvine and playing uh, with your spare time volleyball and raising a family and so forth to becoming uh, an entrepreneur and a uh, and an expert in how to be successful in life. Uh, I took a different path. I, I, I'm actually now uh, went into medicine and became a heart surgeon. And then I went back into industry. And now I work as a medical director for a very large company called Abbott. That's the same company that uh, developed the rapid test for COVID. So it's very interesting for me to see a lot of these uh, eight characteristics, and uh, I can I can say that they apply for many things, uh, and they apply for a lot of the things we do at my work. They apply to medicine and apply for life in general. So uh, it's very very uh, nice to see, and it resonate resonates with my own experience. So it's a pleasure to to see how you evolved and. I uh, commend you for such a fantastic career and success. Well, thank you. And it's been, I think the last time I saw you was at, uh, what's that restaurant? Our families oh. were both. El Fernayo? No. No. 
Stonefire. Stonefire Grill, yes. <laughs> that was the last time I saw you, and that's probably 10 years ago. <laughs> Maybe that's, more. You're up in the valley now, right? I am out in uh, Gora Hills, which okay, is, yeah. Uh, we don't need to to bore everybody else. You and I can 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 catch up separately, but it was nice to see your name there. So let me just call on random people. Steve Acterman. What impact do these have on you? Which one is most most uh, impactful? I'm gonna say persistence. Nothing okay. gets done if you don't keep at it. All right, cool. Ryan Malden. I'd also say persistence. It gives you a chance to work on any of those other uh, characteristics. See, I'm being persistent right now in extracting responses from you guys. Andrea. Oh, Andrea's not coming off mute, huh? Okay, Wendy. Choice. We always have a choice. Even when we choose not to do something, it's a choice, right? Yes. Very well put. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for yeah. that. Re and, and the serenity and, prayer. And, and a lot of times, the choice we make is really to accept what's imposed upon us by, by society, by the world around us. Um, in, in psychology, they call that an external locus of control, whereas successful people have an internal locus of control. They learn that they can make those decisions. They don't have to accept what's thrust upon them by, by the world around them. Okay, Sherman. Um, knowledge. Knowledge, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not about what you know, it's about, you know, who you can leverage to do what you need to get done. Okay. Ah, so that's a little bit of knowledge, but also a little bit of community then if it's who you know, right? Yes. See, it's interesting that these eight things are, are all interweaved to some extent. Um, and when you start exploring one, it often leads into the others. Okay. Srinivas. Oh, I think I already said mine, uh, oh. the, blended, the blended one, right? <laughs> oh, okay, you said, you know what? Every once in a while, the, the videos rearrange. I'm going top to bottom. You were higher yeah. before. Somehow no, no, you I'm, got further down yeah. on my page. No, okay. No, I, like, I like all of them. <laughs> all right. Yeah, <laughs> that's our politician. Okay. Did you go get a poli-sci degree after computer science? <laughs> No, 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 no. After <laughs> after 25 years of marriage, that's what happens to you. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> that's an honorary poli sci degree. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Like, Sarah. Like yeah. I would say that persistence also speaks to me. Okay. Any particular example? Just sticking with something that you're really trying to achieve and like lots of areas of one's life. It just seems to be, I feel as though if I stick with something, eventually, even if I feel really, that it's really an impossible thing, if I stick with it, I, I seem to make it happen, so. Yep, absolutely. All right, we've got two minutes left, two people left, Olivia and Rachel. Okay, oh, I Thorne, did I skip Thorne? I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'll go first just because I have to drop off for a one o'clock meeting. But for me, because I'm new to all of this, opportunity was one of the biggest things with the Venn diagram and, and that chart that you gave me, that's just something to get me at a starting place. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Glad well, it was helpful. Olivia. Um, I would have to say community because um, up until this point, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't realize the importance of connecting with other people, learning from other people, and you, you never really know what that one person can do for you, either it's resource, people, leads, et cetera. So that word uh, popped up for me. Okay, and Goran, who I somehow skipped, sorry. Because I, I, you, saw, you saw my face there, so you, you weren't looking uh, uh, along those lines. But anyway, yeah, I would say for me, action and choice of action or non-action. So in other words, um, uh, the choice of also saying no to something and then so that it allows time for action in another area. Yeah, so so that's about prioritization, right? Right, 
<laughs> and that's where a lot of people fail is they try and do too much. And, and, and when they do that, they're really failing to prioritize. All right, cool. So we're at closing time. I'm happy to stick around for a little while and, and talk more with anybody who wants to, but Jamar, I'll throw it back to you to do closing comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jeff, for, for uh, the presentation and, and spending time with us. I, I got a lot out of it. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone else did as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share a link here, though. That's not the link I was looking for. Um, so um, speaking of choice, um, a lot of folks that have been helping out with the chapter, we choose to spend uh, our time volunteering uh, for the ICS chapter. And so we are, I think at the end of uh, June is, is the end of this fiscal year. So we're actually looking for uh, new uh, and uh, new leaders that may want to come and join us uh, in, in, in the board. Um, Wendy, are you still on? Yes, I am. My camera's not working, but I am definitely here. Sure thing. So Wendy's our advisor, and Wendy, I just wanted to uh, let you have a chance to ch uh, speak a little bit and talk maybe a little bit about the process and how to get in touch either with you or, or us on the board as for people that might be interested in leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Jamar. And I am just so excited about what ICS chapter has done, especially because you first time you had a meeting, it was um, February 2020 under the big alumni tent and then we all know what happened in March 2020 and you all have done an amazing job in um, creating these um, lunch and learns and connecting with your community so if you want to join a group of anteaters that are inspirational and thank you Jeff today very in even though I'm not an entrepreneur um, it was very inspiring and um, giving me some ideas and things to think for in, in my own personal life so so we have um, in April is our recruitment time and we'll have opportunities to see what uh, board positions are available. We have 38 chapters uh, that are thriving and serving the anteater community and there'll be some uh, opportunities for serving on uh, this. I don't, we're not sure yet what this chapter has, but we will by April know what openings are there. There's also openings to serve on different committees um, if it's not a board position and something even like if you're interested in something general like the Orange County chapter, I know they're recruiting some new people also. So um, because you've attended today, we'll make sure that you get information about our uh, recruitment efforts in April. And yes, July 1st is when our new positions start. So once again, kudos to this great ICS chapter and all that you've done. Thank you so much, Wendy. And so I guess um, folks can get in touch with you. Um, uh, if, you if you want to just maybe throw your email down yes. there into chat. Um, also, I, I think we can, um, if you go to the uh, icsanteaters.org um, website uh, and fill out the contact form there, then yeah, we'll be able to get any sort of you know email or message that you might want to send. Also, our emails are out there as well. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you folks for sticking around. Uh, we are a little bit after. If you want to stick around and chat a little, little bit more, um, we'll stay on for, I don't know, let's say another 10, 15 minutes, Jeff. And then if um, folks want to drop, then um, I mean, obviously you're free to go if you, if you would like, but we'll, we'll stick around if you want to chat. Well, yeah, well, thank you so much thanks for, for doing this. Okay. And uh, Jeff, thank you for your time and uh, everybody on the, on the team. I know it's a lot of work, uh, and but this is a really good uh, conversation. So really, thank you for doing it. Yeah, if you like it, by the way, go out and buy the book. I'm, I'm not making any money out of it, but it's actually a good read and, and it, it is inspiring. Sure, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for the insightful discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Look forward to meeting thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah, so Jeff, it does look like a pretty... Um, easy read, or at least I, I um, just kind of flipping through it. Um, so yeah, I definitely need to need to um, uh, take a make a choice to, to uh, <laughs> slot away an afternoon to to actually read it. I did like the business the, the your the business model canvas how um, and I, I've gone through the book before and I've actually like marked it up a bunch. How often do you use it pretty frequently in your consulting? I do, yes. That's awesome. Because 
because creating an old fashioned business plan is just way too resource intensive for, for most organizations. This on the other hand, lets you get going in a general direction and then refine over time. It's very consistent with the lean startup principles mm -hmm. of experiment. You know? get, get Acquire a little bit of knowledge to get in the right general direction and then learn as you go. So, so yes, I actually have started uh, encouraging many of my clients to use, use the concepts there. Is there a organization or group or somebody that you know that is looking for an idea? Like they're a, they have an entrepreneur mindset and they have the time that they want to devote to it and they just need like a really good idea to move forward. So are you the person with the idea or the person who wants to get an idea to start a business? I have an idea. Okay that is conceived into a patent application. Okay. And I would like, and I would like a CEO. <laughs> All right. So, With the entrepreneur mindset to, to take this into the billion dollar company that it is. Oh, all right, good. So, okay. so um, there are a number of organizations. You should, you should um, go to their events once the events started coming. There's Octane, there's Tech Coast, um, Angels, right? The Tech Coast Venture Network. Um, have you been to the Cove? I'm actually in San Diego, but oh, I I travel okay. to Orange County a lot. So, um, so you said Tech Coast Angels, and what was the last one? Tech, Tech Coast, Coast Angels is the biggest angel investor network in the country, um, and all most of them are are successful entrepreneurs who have retired. <laughs> now they invest their money in other startups <clears throat> and they also, to some extent, coach those startups. So, mm -hmm. so um, participating in there, you can get both capital and, and guidance, coaching, mentorship. Um, Tech Ghost Venture Network is a networking association. Now down in San Diego, you have Oh, Gorn Health. What's the name of the organization run by the Admiral? Sorry, I'm, I'm mute. Uh, Connect and then Evo Nexus. Evo Nexus, yes. There's an organization called Evo Nexus, which actually um, will introduce startups to um, companies that might be interested in the product, to investors, and actually provides um, uh, free free office space for, for qualified startups. <laughs> EVO, it, any It's no longer US. free, but it's close to free. Well, it used to be, it, it was free if you qualified to get in. Uh, and, until basically, well, they, they got this from the Irvine company, but then Irvine company started charging money. So then it was, it, they, they, they were taking some small percentage, like a couple of percent of the company or something like that. Uh, I know that they've done some changes lately. And by the way, they used to have the main office in San Diego and a satellite office here, but they did close the satellite office. It closed um, last, last year, March, unfortunately. Yeah, but, in Irvine. But that's, that said, they, they've expanded into the Bay Area, on the other hand. So, oh, uh, I didn't and, know that. Okay. And, and, and then, on the other hand, they, they, they do have a 70% funding rate. If you look on the website, you'll see how... how uh, so, which is pretty amazing. There's very few incubators like that. So it's not just that they provide you space, but they actually try to give you advice and counsel. And you, you are, you are also there. They're trying to keep you to whatever milestones you uh, you set for yourself as you get in. And then there's also Connect, which Connect is uh, the analogous to Octane here, um, and uh, they do. Um, uh, they they have an incubator uh, called Springboard that that can also be. Uh, uh, also, as an alum, you can you can avail yourself of UCI services, um, and you know some of this is virtual connections and so on. Uh, they have a Wayfinder incubator, so you can you can also get counsel and advice. So all of these, by the way, serve uh, startups in different stages. So you you may want to uh, try multiples of them as well. So if you Google UCI Applied Innovation, you'll find the whole program which was set up by Richard Sudak, 
who was actually on this call for a while in the beginning. He's since retired, but he has built a world-class incubation facility on the campus of UCI back on California Avenue. Um, and, and I know and, you're in San Diego, but there's all kinds of events and you should look at the calendar of events and make the, the drive up for some of those events because it's great networking opportunities. So I put that in the in the chat, but but also to yeah. note, uh, so Richard's retired, but not completely retired. Right. He actually is is uh, is still with Tech Coast Angels advising startups and so on. And yes. given his, uh, he actually had a computer uh, science uh, startup that he grew over time and ultimately sold to SAIC, uh, which is down in San Diego. Um, uh, so. So he, uh, so, and again, he got his PhD in business later. He, he was a professor of entrepreneurship at Chapman, uh, chairman of Tech Coast Angels. So, so he's also a good resource overall. Yeah, thank you guys. As, as is normal, there's, there's a lot in the after party. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna ask, uh, if we're I, uh, switching topics, I'm curious about uh, the, the volleyball. So what exactly did, uh, did you and Dan start? 82, 83. I, I was a volleyball player and UCI had a women's volleyball team, but nothing for men. So I went to the gym and I filled out the paperwork to found the UCI volleyball club. This was and, a, this is not the team, it's the club. This was no, this was a club. And then years later, they they started a varsity team. But before there was a varsity.